Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another Kings of War tournament report. That's right, two in fairly quick succession. The last one was only a couple of weeks ago. So, this tournament, yet again, 2,000 points, and this one was the Woodland Realm. I'm not sure what relevance these titles actually have to the tournament. Usually they seem to be kind of arbitrary titles that don't really mean anything, and I'm sure that was the case here because most of the tables were not, in fact, woodland-themed. So this was from Black Dragon Miniatures, which is in Hinkley, near Leicester. So it's quite a way away from me, a couple of hours. So let's start off by talking about my list, shall we? Because that's obviously the most exciting part. And there is a chat going there, so if anyone wants to leave any comments, feel free. There's still a few people chin-wagging away in there. I can see Dreddy and Mickey Jenver and newbie among others in there at the moment so feel free to go nuts and ask any questions you like about the games as they're going on and i'll be able to see your little comments there so at the last tournament i was reasonably pleased with parts of my army there was a few elements that i wasn't particularly thrilled with and then i tried out a few other things in the game that was uploaded yesterday i uploaded that at about nine o'clock in the morning so that people who went to the tournament wouldn't be able to see what i was thinking heading into the tournament so a few changes to that as well so here's my list a horde of sharp sticks this is orange goblins of course folks as you can see in the image there the horde of sharp sticks don't have anything fancy on them the horde of spitters which i also had at the last tournament but i've given them a different item this time a very cheap one i've just given them fire oil which is only really useful against units that have regeneration, but it's really cheap, it's only five points, and I think the benefit you get from it, it's gonna come up at least once or twice throughout the tournament. There's plenty of units out there with regeneration, and some armies that have almost nothing but regeneration across their whole army. So I thought that was gonna come in useful, possibly, and at five points, it's not really too much of a loss if it doesn't even come into play. Then we've got two hordes of trolls, one with the dwarven ale, as usual, because as you know, if you're any kind of Kings of War expert, trolls are quite likely to get wavered because they have quite a big gap between the waver and the route number compared to other units. So having Dwarven Ale, which means they might ignore the effects of wavered is very nice. And also with that in mind, my other troll horde, I've given the Brew of Courage, which effectively boosts their nerve by one. So it's gonna make it even more difficult to waver or route them because they are quite a big target, those troll units. They do pack a serious punch, and of course they have regeneration as well, so people tend to focus fire on them, just so they don't get a chance to regenerate at all. Next, we've got Fleabag Riders, a regiment of those. Nothing special on them. The Fleabag Rider Sniffs, I've taken them down to a troop, so just five of those, so they're quite cheap. I didn't really like how the bigger unit of those was performing, because they still don't do that much at range and it gets a bit expensive for my taste at that level. So I just wanted to use these just to throw in someone's way maybe, and they can fire off a few annoying shots here and there. You'd maybe expect them to get one damage on a target, which is quite tasty. Then, War Trombone, of course. Can't leave home without a War Trombone. Most goblin lists include three. I only own one, so there's only one in there. The Big Rocks Thrower makes its way back into my goblin fest. I took the sharp stick thrower to the last tournament, but wasn't really pleased with it. Even when it hits, it's kind of a rarity when war machines do hit. And when the sharp stick thrower hits, it doesn't do enough damage for my liking. So the big rock thrower is just a, a big threat to everybody. Because when it does hit, it's doing D6 plus two hits with piercing three. So it's pretty terrifying. So you'd, if it actually lands on someone, you'd expect it to be doing like four or five damage on them with any luck. So that's scary. For especially for high armoured units. Then a Flagget, of course running around to spread is inspiring on a flea bag, and I've given him the Diadem of Dragonkind to give me another breath weapon on top of the War Trombone, which is handy against flyers and for picking things off, reliably doing a small amount of damage late on when you compare it to the Holy Hand Grenade, which I have tried recently, which does a lot of damage but it only hits 50% of the time, so I'd rather have the reliability of a breath weapon. Then we've got a Bigot, who you may recall at the last tournament exploded. That's because it was closed lists, so I felt good putting that kind of kamikaze dynamite vest on him to blow up. But this was open lists, this tournament, so it seems kind of pointless because he just gets shot once people know he has that. So instead, he's still on a flea bag, but I've given him the mace of crushing, just as a little extra to try and get him that one guaranteed damage. The thing thinking behind him is that 
if I am coming up against some huge shooty horde that I need to stop shooting for a turn, he can charge into them with the Mace of Crushing. Hopefully he can do one damage to them, and that will disorder them and prevent them from shooting. And also, if I need to just finish off a unit, he can either charge them or he has three shots with his bow as well. So I would hope he could do one damage whenever he attacks. That's the dream for him, just to finish things off, and then also I can throw him in the way of things. Then, on the next page, we have a whiz. Now, I've got two wizards, one on a flea bag, one not on a flea bag. They both have Bane Chant, and the one on a flea bag, I've also given him the Inspiring Talisman, because I found I didn't have enough Inspiring at the last tournament, so I was losing a lot of units through marginally lucky rolls that would have had to have been re-rolled had I had them in Inspiring range, so a bit more Inspiring there. Then we've got a Troll Bruiser with the Blade of Slashing, because he hits on a 3+. So I'd expect to probably miss one of those. So Blade of Slashing just allows me to reroll that because his attacks are so good, rerolling one is actually quite a benefit because he has strength, crushing strength three. So pretty tasty to get to reroll one of those potential misses. Then a Mincer, which is good for, it's like the backup to the Giants. If one of the Giants goes down, the Mincer can just be behind ready to fill in and dishing out similar kinds of pain to the Giant. They just can't take it quite as much. So. Then two Giants as well, up from the last tournament where I only took one. Back to the two Giants this time. And usually I like that better, but sometimes they really underperform and you get tempted to drop one of them, but I think you do miss them. So, if you missed any of the list there, you can look in the video description. And also you can see a picture of my army here in the first tournament image. So, you can see it contrasts nicely with this desert-themed table that I was on in the first game, and I actually started off the, the day on table one, so no pressure at all, and you can see that I was up against dwarves there, and this is actually a new scenario we were playing here, so I'll have to get the old tournament sheet out here. So these are, to my knowledge, there were some scenarios that are going to feature in the, the new the Clash of Kings tournament book that's coming out. If any of these are not identical to the, to the scenarios in that book, someone let me know. But as far as I'm aware, this is what they are. Whether they'll be tweaked at all after this particular text was released, I don't know. But I'll tell you what this scenario was. So this was Eliminate. So, in essence, you have units with bounties on them. Your three most expensive units, not including individuals, have a bounty on their heads. And if you kill those units in close combat, then you get two victory points. If you kill them with shooting, you don't get any. So that may be a scenario that's been put in there to address the prevalence of shooting heavy armies that are out there. Also, if you survive to the end of the game with the unit that has a bounty on it, then you gain one victory point. So there are benefits to killing them even with shooting as a last resort, because you're gonna prevent the opponent taking that victory point. In addition to that, there is also an objective in the center, which you can see on this table represented by a wishing well, right in the middle there. And if you hold that at the end of the game, if you control it, if you have a unit within three inches and the enemy doesn't, then you'll get one victory point for that as well. So quite a few victory points on offer, and we'll go through the armies and I'll show you which units have the bounties on them as well. In a, in a case where there are multiple units that are the same value, then I think the opponent chooses which one has the bounty on it. So, here we go. You can see that both my units of trolls have a bounty on them, represented by that green token, because they're 190 points, plus they have upgrades on them, which take them above 200. So, my two most expensive units there. And after that, my most expensive units were the giants. So, my opponent was just able to pick one of my giants to put a bounty on, which we'll get to in a second. You can see the bruiser with the trolls, of course, and the mincer is going to be providing backup for the trolls here in this game. Then we've got the Giants right next to them. I tend to call this the meaty center tactic. But on this game, if we go back, you can see that they're kind of a flanking of a huge, not really a flank, it's the bulk of the army. But then I've just got one weaker flank with all my other units, which I'm hoping to just hold up his flank there. And so all the, the beefy stuff in the middle can just crunch through everything he's got. As we move on, you can see that I think it's this giant here the male giant has the bounty on it. He chose to put it on that one. So if he kills those three units in close combat, there's a lot of victory points coming his way. 
I've got the flaggets behind them and the war trombone as well. I've got the big rock thrower right in the middle there of that big, huge, meaty wall that I've put up there. So I'm thinking he's not really going to be able to get to that, probably. He's only going to be able to shoot it. And is he going to waste his time shooting at something that most of the time is going to miss? I would say probably not when he's got trolls and giants coming towards him. Then next to them, we've got all my shooty stuff. We've got my spitters and my sniffs. And then behind them, we've got the regular flea bags, the two wizards. And right at the end, we've got the sharp sticks, who are really just there to hold this flank. That's all their job is going to be. And we've also got the bigots down there as well. So you can see there that the giant's got the token on him. And just to clarify, they have the bounty there. I don't know why I took that additional picture, but you can see his forces here. Now, this is actually a really well-painted dwarf army, this. Very, very nice indeed. I've seen these on Facebook before, but a very nice kind of yellow and black brownish color scheme, which is very, very tasty. So he has got... Now, it's hard to remember exactly what all the dwarf units are because they all look very similar, but he's got some shield breakers, which are the ones with crushing strength, and I think those might be these ones here because they don't have shields. So those are probably shield breakers. He's got a king on a large beast, which is a, a Reaper Bones model, which looks really good with the dwarf on it. He's got a Berserker Lord on a badger there. He's got a Greater Earth Elemental represented by a giant dwarf. He's got a big horde there. I think they're just regular dwarves in a big horde. One of these units around here is Iron Guard, which are the really, really tough ones. Actually, the ones over there might be Iron Guard, to be honest. I can't remember. They all look very, very similar to me. But he's got Brock Riders there. He's got a Flame Belcher, and he's got the Bombard, which is like a catapult, but being represented by a cannon clearly there. So that can fire indirectly, so it's kind of like a mortar. Then over there, he's got two shooter units. He's got sharpshooters and the regular... I'll just get the, the dwarf page open in the book, actually, so I can give you the correct name of one of these units because there is a, a special named character in here that I'm going to name for you as soon as I can find the page. Okay, here we go. I think this guy is Sveri Egilax, the guy at the back there who is a very big hero, large cavalry. He costs 240 points, so he's got quite a lot of special rules as well. He's got elite and vicious, lots of attacks, so he's tasty. He's very, very good. So I'm a bit concerned about him. And these two units here, some of them are your standard dwarves, some of them slightly better, but I can't remember which is which. Okay, moving on. You can see that he's, he's actually going straight into my face here. He's not holding back. Even though he's got a few shooting units, he is not messing about at all. He's getting right up there, moving as fast as he can with everything. The one thing to notice about this Greater Earth Elemental is that it's shambling, but he doesn't have anyone to surge it. So you're losing a little bit of its potential there, I think. And I'm not advancing quite so rapidly because he's coming right towards me. So on this side where I've got my shooting, I'm obviously holding back and just peppering him with shots. And in the center, I've pushed my giants up a little bit into the difficult terrain because, of course, giants can charge out of difficult terrain unhindered because they're cool like that. And I've put my flag at the front ready to do some strategic blocking, no doubt. And I think I actually moved it forward so I could use his diadem of dragonkind and flame somebody with it. So that's why he's at the front there right now. The trolls moved up a bit and just formed this little defensive wall here, preparing for the onslaught, because I don't have anything to on this side to counteract the speed of the Brock Riders, but the rest of his army is painfully slow. So I'm going to expect the charge from them, and possibly a couple of characters, but not much else. So they're ready to hold off that impact. Turn two. You can see that I've got my bigot over there, who's just making a nuisance of himself, really, just positioning himself at a bit of an awkward angle to give him something to think about. And he's got his king on large beast and this tough unit. I think these are the iron guard, actually. These are the really high defense ones, I think. Then in the middle, you can see that one of his hordes has his bounty on it there. It also has a throwing mastiff. And I don't think... No, no, no units over there have the bounty on them, but they do, that horde, and also the badgers, who you can see have charged into the trolls here. And Sveri, I kept wanting to call him Sven, this guy, 
but he's got a bounty on him as well, which you can see next to him because it won't fit on his base. So both these units with bounties have come really close here. So I'm thinking I'm going to be able to eat them because this guy wasn't able to join this charge. I think he was just out of range, so he just moved in there ready to attack next time. But this unit here certainly did charge my trolls, and taking a, a full-on charge from Brock Riders is never fun. But they are inspired by the Bruiser, and they are going to be... They are the, it's the unit with the Dwarven Ale, these trolls, so even if they get wavered, they'll still be able to counter-charge him. Over on the other side, you can see that he's gone straight for my sharp stick unit, so he's not messing around at all, gets straight in there. You can see the little bits of damage that he's taken already from various shooting attacks here at the back there. It's a very nice death markers there with the numbers. Very, very nice. And in the centre, his horde moves up, but of course, leaving himself vulnerable because he's not got a speed advantage here. So what I do is I charge both my giants straight into the front of that horde, and the flea bag sniffs into the flank. That is mainly to block this thing here, I'm pretty sure. So I was also hoping they would add, add in a couple more damage and maybe get rid of this unit in one go, but giants aren't known for their huge number of attacks. So I wasn't able to take them out in one fell swoop, but I've done some significant damage to them. You can see that looks like that might be a two there. There's a six. It might, it might have done more than that. I can't remember. Then over here, you can see his big earth elemental has taken some damage. I'm concentrating my shooting on him, even though he's probably in cover behind certain things. I've got some breath weapons to shoot him as well, so obviously they're not affected by cover at the moment. They apparently will be, though, when the changes are made to the rules. Over here, you can see that his badgers did a bit of damage to the trolls, but I regened a lot of it, and then I hit him back. I think it was a triple charge, actually, with the bruiser possibly in the flank, the mincer and the trolls in the front, and I just completely minced them alive. So the brocks are dead, which gives me two victory points because I killed them in melee. So a good start there. And he's still got Sferi hovering very close to my trolls. So he's pretty tasty, but the trolls are only taking two damage. So I'm fairly confident they can survive that. They've turned to face him and everyone else has turned to look that way towards the main bulk of the battle. You can see these trolls have taken six damage from various shooting attacks, I think. But of course, with the regen, I'm not too worried about trolls taking damage early in the game, especially against a slow army that can't dictate the charges. You can see I've parked my flagget in front of them, and then he would have used his breath weapon on somebody from there as well, because this unit moved up into range while his badgers charged in, I think. So they would have been in range to charge someone, so I've just blocked them off nicely. So I don't think they've got much chance of overrunning into the bruiser. They would have to kill the, the flagget and probably roll a six, or maybe a five, to get there. And here's a nice overview of how the battle's looking at the moment. Over on that side, I've got my cavalry are next to the sharp sticks there. So I'm hoping I can hold up his king on large beast over there for a while, because that's going to be quite tasty if it gets in. And I'm thinking I'm probably going to kill this unit very soon, which is going to be more victory points for me. And I think my trolls are looking relatively safe, because I've got a lot of units here. I've got the bruiser, the mincer that can go in here. So this unit of trolls, even though they're wavered right now, it's not necessary that they put themselves in harm's way at the moment. That giant also has the bounty on him as well. So I'll have to be careful with him. Turn three. Okay, you can see that he wavers my cavalry there, my flea bags, with his king on large beast. And these iron guard, I'm pretty sure they're iron guard, they are having a bit of a pillow fight with the sharp sticks because those guys are defense six, but they don't dish out much pain. So very much a pillow fight there. Here in the middle, you can see that that unit kills off my flagget, but then they weren't able to overrun very far. So he did his job, he just laid down his life to stop me being charged. Tactical advantage. And look at this though. Sferi, the absolute monster that he is with 10 attacks, completely annihilated that troll unit who had only taken two damage previously in one go. Oh dear, oh dear, that's turned the tides a bit. So he's got two victory points in the bag now for killing them in close combat which I wasn't really anticipating. I didn't think he'd chew through them in one go. So that could mess me up a bit. Up here, you can see that there's a bit of fighting going on between this dwarf unit here and the troll bruiser and the mincer. And over here, my trolls have advanced through there, and you can see why, I think. You can see the top of his hand there. My bigot here is charged into the flame belcher, but he does zero damage. Wow, so he hasn't even disordered it, so it can still fire next turn. 
So I think what happened here was my trolls joined in with the charge, with the giants, and they finished off that big dwarf unit there. And then they overran up to there, but they're probably going to get flamed in the face because of the bigot failing to do any damage against a war machine. That's nine attacks when he charges a war machine. All of them failed. So that was very, very bad. And my giants overran just far enough to stay out of the charge arc of this guy here, this greater earth elemental, because that would have been very bad if he'd charged them. His charge arc is something like that. So they're both just out of it. And I've parked a wizard in front of him as well, just for good measure, because I want to really annoy that thing. I don't want that to start beating up on my giants, because if anything can take them down, it would be him, I would imagine. Over on this side, that pillow fight continues. Nothing exciting to report there, and we're into turn four. So currently, I am in the lead, because I've got four victory points, because I've wiped out two of his units that had bounties on their heads. He's wiped out one of mine, but you can see my trolls have been shot to death by the Flame Belcher. So they were carrying a bounty, which means that he's not going to get two victory points for killing them. But at the end of the game, he's going to deprive me of victory points because they're not alive anymore. So he wasn't confident he could kill them in close combat at all. as He thought he'd just get rid of them before it was too late because, of course, they would have been regening the whole time as well. So they're gone due to... The bigot's really not damaging that thing with nine attacks. Over here, you can see that he gets a bit more luck. I think his king on large beast actually joined in this charge as well, because this unit of flea bags were wavered previously, so he didn't have to worry about them so much. And with all that damage, because of course, the phalanx rule only works to the front, so if this guy had any thunderous charge, he would actually get it, because he was attacking them in the flank. So they're wavered. So not very good, but they're holding them up for a bit longer. At least they didn't die. Over here, his Greater Earth Elemental charges the wizard and fails to do a single point of damage. That was another terrible roll, but from him this time. So that is quite funny, because that means the wizard can still cast spells now. Comedy moment there. And you can see I had my Mincer parked in front of Sferi, because I didn't want him charging into the back of any of my trolls or my giants up there. So I just parked this in front of him, and he charged in there, and it looks like he only did one damage to it as well unless this picture was taken prematurely. That might just be the picture of me parking it, actually. He might be about to attack it. I had, I had to actually park it lengthways like that. That was the only way I could stop him getting past, even though it's going to mean the end of the mincer. It's a small price to pay, I think, because I've got my expensive bounty unit up there, my, one of my giants, so I want to keep this tough guy away as long as possible. This giant decides to show the bigot how it was done and charges up onto the hill and kills the flame belcher easily so he's still carrying my bounty and he's just going to make a run for the hills no doubt and my bigot is making his way over there towards his shooty units to hopefully charge them and put one damage on them just so they can't shoot at the giant turn five so we're closing in on the end and i'm currently in the lead of course the wishing well will come into play as well there's going to be a victory point for holding that at the moment my giant is standing right on it but he's attacking my giant with his Berserker Lord on a brock there. I've got my War Trombone coming up to spray some flamey goodness around as well. So at this stage, I think it's looking quite good for me. All that stuff at the back is, of course, dead. It's just still perched on the table. His shooter units are both over on this side, so they can threaten the giant, but he doesn't have anything to threaten it in close combat at the moment because Sferi is tied up with the Mincer, and his brock with the Berserker Lord on it is tied up with this giant. And of course, his Greater Earth Elemental, yet again, is stuck on the wizard. So that giant's feeling quite safe at the moment. Over here, you can see that my giant hit, took a bit of damage from the Berserker Lord on Brock, but then hit back and killed it in one go, because I think it had already taken some damage, possibly from the War Trombone. There, his Greater Earth Elemental, which you can see is up to 11, because of all the little shooting attacks I've been aiming at it, has put four damage onto the wizard. but can't roll high enough to even waver it. So he's stopped it from casting spells because it's disordered now, but it's still parked in front of him really annoyingly, so he can't turn around. Had he killed it, he would have turned around to face my giant and given me quite a conundrum right there. Then this giant is walking towards the right-hand side of the table just to get out of the firing arc of the sharpshooters, I think. So he's only going to... Or one of the shooter units. So he's only going to be in the firing arc of one of the shooter units rather than both if he'd gone left, pretty much. That was my thinking there. And Mr. Bigot was hoping that they wouldn't even be able to shoot when he charged them. 
if he'd put one damage on them, then they wouldn't have been able to shoot, of course. But, of course, yet again, he failed. So I don't think he's succeeded with a single attack so far in this game, this bigot. So he's not really justifying his choice at the moment. And we're into turn five. So my sharp sticks have gone down, and he's got all these units on the left flank piling in. But it's kind of irrelevant over here, because none of these units are worth any bounty. So it's going to be all about kill points, because in this tournament, it's not the difference between how much you kill, it's just how much you kill that determines how many points you're going to get on top of either winning, losing, or getting a draw. So it's worth just throwing units in there trying to get kills. Even if they die, you're, it's only bet benefiting your opponent, not the entire tournament field. Then, you can see here that his giant is trying, still trying to get rid of that wizard, and he's got Sferi past the mincer. He killed it, and he's come into the giant now, who's sitting on the wishing well. So that giant needs to hold on to secure that area, because it's going to be a contested victory point, but that just means no one will get it. I don't want him getting it. And over on this side, you can see that he's he can shoot past this bigot, by the way, because he's only an individual, so he won't provide any blockage of sight or anything. And look, he's pointing at the unit with glee because they shot down the giant. He actually took more damage than that, but I didn't put the dice down yet. We were just seeing if he was dead before I put the damage on it. And they did actually kill him, because this guy, because he was attacking, wasn't enraged to inspire, so it was a pretty good roll, and off he went. So he doesn't get victory points for it, but it pr prevents me from taking a victory point at the end. So at the moment, the only bounty that's surviving is actually on Sferi here. This one, that's his wound marker. So he's still got a bounty. I killed two of his in close combat, so I'm on four. He's surviving with one, and he killed one of mine in close combat. So that'll give him three. So I'm in the lead, so I need this giant to not die and hold on to stop him claiming this objective, which would make it a draw. And you can see that he wavers the giant here, which isn't much use because giants can still counter charge when they're wavered. And this guy has turned to face the giant now. But I think, no, it's not the end yet. So you can see that my trombone has come up. I'm hoping to finish off that thing with the trombone. And he's killed off my flea bags right there as well, as expected, charging them in the flank with the king on large beast in the front. So he's mopping up quite a few of my units, but I'm still in pole position. At worst, I'm going to get a draw at the moment. And I'm trying to stop these guys shooting now by charging into them. And I think he actually puts one damage on them. So hooray for the bigots finally causing a wound on anybody. And you can see that's the end there. So this is pretty much the end scene that matters here. So he wasn't able to kill the giant. He only wavered it. And then the giant, when it hit back, couldn't kill off him. So I ended up winning four victory points to three because nobody claimed the center. Had the giant died, and it was already on 12 damage, so it wouldn't have taken an absurd roll to remove it. So nice that that survived, preventing it from being a draw. One win in the bag. And I did kill a reasonable amount, so I think the maximum amount of points you can get in each round is 10. You get five points for a win. And then you get one to five points based on how much of the enemy's army you killed. And I think I got three points worth. So I think it was an eight, probably about an eight, four win, because you get one point for a loss. And then I think he killed three points worth of my army as well. So it sounds like an eight, four. So in round two, I'm going to be towards the top of the table here. I think I was either on, I might have been on table two here. So you can see I'm up against undead. And this is another new scenario, but it's got familiar a familiar stench to it. So essentially, it is pillage, but the objectives are worth a random amount. So you still have a random number of objectives, and when you're placing them, just before you place it, you roll to see how many it's victory points it's worth on D3. So you can see that quite a few of them are worth two here. I don't think we had any that were worth one. There's one worth three right up there. There's a three right here in front of my army. There's a two right in the center. There's a two down here. And there are some more as well, we'll be able to see from a different angle. But this was obviously taken during turn one. My opponent wasting no time moving his army forward there, so I'll go through what he's got momentarily after I go through my formation as well. You can see the other objectives are there. That one's worth three. So to control those, you have to be within three inches of them at the end of the game, and the opponent can't be within three inches. But individuals and war machines can't take them at all. So... 
you can see I've got my little rock thrower right in this corner because I know he's not going to send anything over here after it because all this fast stuff is on the other side pretty much. And I've got my flea bags here just to provide a bit of threat and maybe take some of these objectives. I've got my spitters in the difficult terrain so anyone who charges them might have a bit of trouble. The wizard there to bane chant them. A bit of a variation on the meaty center technique here. I've got my sharp sticks right in the middle. Giants on that side, trolls on the other side, mincer behind, or trombone for backup. Over on this side, all I want to do with this flank is just hold up certain units. That is the Lady Alona vampire. So she's like she's like a regular vampire lord, but better in all respects, slightly. So she has a lot of attacks, defense six, she's fast as well. So I'm hoping that my fleabag sniffs and my bigots can just hold things up over here and then maybe prove to be a bit of a, a speedy annoyance in the flank because he's got wraiths. He's got wraiths all over the place. There's a unit there. He's got a vampire and a dragon right there with werewolves. So he's got a lot of speed over on this flank, which you can see in glorious detail here. And then in the center, he's got two more units of wraiths at the back. He's got zombie trolls. He's got a zombie horde. He's got a revenant king who has a bit of surge ability about him. So not too much surge ability in this army, but he's still got some there, and the vampires could always use it if need be. But there's usually better uses for vampires. Then there is a revenant horde there. So they have fire oil on them as well. So that's why I deployed my trolls miles away from them, because that's the one matchup I don't want. Revenants with an extra crushing strength on them would probably make mincemeat of trolls. So I've left them way over there. I had more drops, of course, so I could kind of dictate where my units went in relation to his, which is also why you've seen my rock thrower right in this corner, away from all his fast stuff. You can see the two objective there. Okay, so first thing first, I've decided that my bigot doesn't want to die yet, so he's just hiding behind this woods so Lady Alona can't charge him. And my fleabag sniffs just charged into those wraiths, hoping to do one damage to stop them flying and basically laying down their lives. And I think, I can't remember whether they actually did any damage, but even if they didn't, they would have still been obscuring the view of this unit, especially the trolls who are height two, the same as the fleabags. So you wouldn't have been able to see trolls over the top of this unit. So they did their job regardless of whether they did damage there. And in the center, I'm just advancing up slowly, particularly with the giants. I don't want to get too in his face because I've got shooting and he has none. And he's going to he's gonna be moving in all this fast stuff in one fell swoop. I've played against this guy before, and he's, he sets up multi-charges very well. So I'm aware of that, and I'm keeping it in mind. I'm making sure not to leave anything that's too important in a position where it can be just crushed in the flanks and so forth. I've got my flea bags moved up a little bit, so they are actually controlling this objective at the moment. So he's going to have to do something about them at some stage. He can't just leave them there for the whole game, because otherwise they'll just be giving me three points. And of course, they're so fast, I can use them to strike if I just need to take out a flank. And you can see that his revenants have already taken damage there at the back. There's a couple of blue dice there. That's because the rock thrower landed on their head. I may have, have a picture of that coming up. Yeah, there we go. Nine damage. So in the first turn, the rock landed right on them. So they're already looking vulnerable. They're a really tough unit, but against the piercing three rock landing on them, nothing really stands up well to that. So a really good roll there to get them damaged early on. Now, this is a triple charge that he did pull off here into my sharp sticks. So I don't know whether he would have been able to do it against my trolls, because he wouldn't have had enough space, I think, because these units are quite wide, the werewolves in particular. So he's got wraiths in there and the dragon. So I'm thinking he's going to kill that unit in one go. But his vampire dragon is going to be kind of stuck there. So it'll probably end up getting charged by the trolls. And I've got other units in here as well that are going to cause him a bit of pain, hopefully. So if I had to lose one unit to a big multi-charge, the sharp sticks are one I don't mind losing so much because I've still got my trolls and I think my giants are over here. The rest of his army is just moving forwards in a big solid lump of pain. It's quite scary, but slow lump for the most part. The wraith's backing them up as well so they're not to be trifled with. And of course, having wraiths lurking behind your lines is handy because if I were to charge into one of these units, the wraiths with their 10 inch move could possibly land behind me and then turn round, and then the Revenant King, who's height two, could see over height one things and then surge them into the back of a unit. So maybe they're being held in reserve for some kind of shenanigans like that.
but of course, having played Undead, I try to keep these things in mind. Generally, once you've played an army a few times, you start to not necessarily figure out all the tricks, but you know the kind of thing you should be looking for and what not to take for granted. So those wraiths do kill off my fleabag sniffs, but they've been held up for a turn, which is what I wanted. So they're stuck up there for now, which will allow me to counterattack. And the mincer counterattacks into the werewolves, you can see there. And I think his wraiths actually were here. But I moved all my shooty things in position and annihilated them. So that's the war trombone, the flagget with the diadem of dragonkind, and I think this wizard bane chanted up the war trombone. So those wraiths there were killed in one go. I think they were slightly out of inspiring range of his dragon, which is up there. So they exploded, which is a very nice bonus because they would have been able to cause me some serious trouble if they'd survived. And you can see him moving his dragon into my trolls here. This will be a counter charge, presumably, because I would have charged him with the bruiser and the trolls, which is why he's taken five damage. But it wasn't enough to get rid of him because he has the ensorcelled armor, which you won't be allowed to do after the rules update. So this dragon defense six won't see won't be seeing any of these in the future, as far as I'm aware. Now, rock thrower. Surely it can't hit two turns in a row on a five plus. Oh, what do you know? It does. It lands, and these guys are now up to 15 damage, so another 6. So they're practically at death's door, and they haven't got anywhere near the fight yet. So I'm sure he's not too thrilled with that. The rock on a 5-plus hitting in the first two turns. Lovely. Now we're on to turn 3. You can see a nice stylish piece of clothing there. Clearly not mine, because it's not orange. Here, trolls have gone into the wraiths there, and my trolls and my bruiser are still fighting against this dragon here. The werewolves are still alive when this picture was taken. And this big mass here is slowly creeping forward. My giants are ready to pounce on it, but it's a huge wall of meat he's got right here. And look at that, his wraiths take more damage from shooting. I think this is probably from the archers. So they're all the way up to 18 damage now. And look at that. His dragon kills off one of my units of trolls. Oh dear, oh dear. And he's taken a bit of damage though. I think that'll be a, a six behind there, most likely. So he's taken some damage. And Lady Ilona has come in round the back, charged into my bruiser at this point. So it's going to be an interesting fight, but she's got a, an advantage because she can be leeching her wounds back. But of course I can regen mine. So if she doesn't roll very well, it could go on for a while. And my trolls... I've killed off, he had a unit of wraiths here, I think, so they're dead. And his werewolves have gone by this point as well, you may have noticed. Now, they got killed. I don't think there's an actual picture of the spot, because when things happen in my turn, obviously I can't take pictures at that exact moment, and then certain things have moved by the time the camera gets to it, but you can see them still alive here. And I think they actually kill off the mincer. However, they don't manage to get out of the way, and they get countercharged. I think it might be a rear charge from my troll unit, which gets them killed. I think he made a little miscalculation when deciding how far he needed to move. So they ended up getting killed. And you can see, he's still got this big wall of meat, but it's heavily damaged. And you can see we've both got quite a bit of time left going into turn four. And look at this, I don't roll well enough on the nerve to get rid of this revenant unit, only a five on the two dice. So they are still alive. Oh dear, oh dear. And you can see here that Lady Alona, I'm not sure if this model actually is a lady, but it's representing her, has put eight damage on the bruiser, but couldn't get rid of him. So that's going to hold her up, which is really nice. That's the bruiser's one mission in life now, just to hold her up and hopefully regenerate wounds so he can survive another turn or so. Here, I had a wizard parked in here somewhere and he's charged his zombies into them and wavered the wizard, which means that the zombies are going to get charged in the rear now because I've got trolls lurking up there. So he really wanted to kill that wizard and then turn around on the spot because you don't want to get charged in the rear by trolls. That's never good. And the giant gets double charged by the revenants who barely cling onto life and the zombie trolls put all that damage on him, 13 damage, but then rolled a double one. So... Lovely, the giant survives. And the other giant then kills off the 
revenants. Actually, I think the spitters also charged into that combat as well, just to provide a bit of help, which is how they've pivoted to face that way now after the combat. The giant's looking this way, ready to help out here, and the giant put some damage onto the zombie trolls, not too much. But that whiz is still stuck in there. Now, you normally can't be within an inch of enemy models, but the, he was there as a result of certain units charging past him, I think, which is why he's still stuck there. And those trolls are going into the back of the zombies right there, you can see. Revenant King just lingering. Over here, you can see this fight still going on. And look how many wounds the troll bruiser's taken now. He was on eight a minute ago, so he must have regened a ton of them back, which is going to be really annoying for her to finish him off under those circumstances. And the dragon has managed to turn around to back to face this way again because he didn't have any charged targets over there. So he's about to lay down some pain shortly, but he has taken a fair bit of damage, so he's not too healthy. You can see I put 12 damage on those zombies because it was a hindered charge going through the difficult terrain there with the trolls. So I didn't get that many hits even in the rear, tripling their attacks. Over here you can see the trombone and the diadem have moved up, which were no doubt targeting probably at him, trying to take him out with their breath weaponry. But he's still holding on to life. Going into turn 5, not that much time left. And here you can see that because the dragon is alive, he charged into the rear of the spitter horde. Because there's an objective up there which is being hotly contested with my flea bags and some wraiths. So I, he didn't want the spitters to join in that fight. So he has charged into the back of the unit there. And he's put the revenant king into the flank as well. Put a lot of damage on them. But then here comes the juiciest double one that you could wish for. Double one in that unit, which is... It's basically wasted to very, one very hard-hitting unit and one reasonable, reasonably hitty character in the same turn. They've effectively wasted their damage because this isn't a very useful unit at this stage of the game, to be honest. But they were kind of threatening this region here. But the double one, so they're stuck there. And he already used his charity reroll earlier in the game, so he couldn't reroll that. If I hadn't mentioned it before, then this tournament was using the pay five pounds, get one reroll per game rule. The zombies have turned round, so they're going to be fighting against the trolls here. That's no doubt a counter charge. And here you can see that the spitters have actually run off here. I can't remember whether they actually charged that unit or not. I think they probably did, to be honest. And this guy is stuck here. You can see that he's actually wavered, which is going to effectively take him out of the rest of the game because I've got quite a lot of annoying shooting attacks in this army and most of them have survived to this point so the little bit of damage that was put on him was enough to keep him wavered and this giant here is facing off against the trolls after they killed the other giant so that objective there is worth three for the last three turns of the game or so I was very very conscious of the objectives and I was I noticed that he didn't really have anything in position to take an objective beyond a certain point in the game. It was very limited in which ones he could take other than this one. With his wraiths, obviously, because I would fancy the wraiths to beat the flea bags in a straight up fight because he got the charge in, because I didn't want to move away from the objective. Over here, these trolls, after they wipe out the zombies, they move backwards so that they're guarding this objective, which is worth two. So at the moment, they're the only unit that are holding any objective at all. And in the middle here, my bruiser is still fighting Lady Alona. Look, he's only on four damage with it regening all the time, and she failed terribly with her rolls multiple times. So, of course, he's still wavered. That fight's still going on. And he was working out whether or not this unit of trolls could move backwards and get to within range of this objective here. But in the end, we determined that they were just out, so they couldn't do that. You can see all my little shooting attacks that moved up here, which is why he ended up being wavered. Over here, uh, I'm not sure exactly what's gone on here. It looks very similar to the last shot, but really there's not a lot of killing going on here. Turn six. Okay, we've got about five minutes left each. And I was just in case it wasn't clear in the other images, this guy is wavered, so he's not going to be able to do anything in turn six, which is a really big blow for him. And Lady Alona finally kills the Troll Bruiser, but it's too late to affect the game hugely because she's not going to be able to go off and kill anybody else. 
and I don't think the troll bruiser was holding an objective. Over here, he can't quite kill the flea bags, which he needed to do, and which would then give him that objective which was worth three, and the one I'm on is only worth two. So we'll see some other shots in a minute to see how that could have played out differently. But his Revenant King here was forced to attack the big spitter horde, who were double wand earlier, and finished them off in one go. They were already, I think they might have already been beyond the point of double wandage before he attacked them, so he only needed to do a bit and he removed them. So the flea bags needed to hold on, and they did. Over here, the trolls and the giant, wavering a giant, again, pointless because they can counter charge, of course, while wavered. And these trolls are sitting up there. There is an objective down here worth three victory points. So I think, had he been able to take out my flea bags, I may have been able to move this unit. They're in difficult terrain, so they wouldn't have been able to march, but I may have been able to get to within three inches of the objective down here, possibly, which would have made it a draw. You can see where it is there. So that gap there, I think they could have made that. I think they possibly could have done. It would have been pretty close. I think that they probably would have been just in range to do it if I'd needed it. But I already knew before my turn that I'd already won the game by this point. So I didn't actually need to move them. And then here, this guy, I put more damage on him with my shooting, but only rolled three on his nerve. So if I'd killed him, it would have pushed me up a threshold in the amount of points I got for the game, I think. So that would have been a nice bonus. I couldn't finish off that unit either. So, yep, yeah, there he is, surviving the game on 14 damage due to that bad roll right there. And that's the end. So you can see the only objective that was held was this one here. Two victory points for the trolls because this one, sitting right under them, I, we both had units within three inches of it. So there you go. That was a win, that game right there. And it was... It was very, very close. It was pretty much on a knife edge, as you can tell, because if he'd killed that unit, he would have had that three out right there, and I would have had to move my trolls down to this one, which would have made it a draw. So very, very, very tight. That guy just clinging onto life at the end. Very close. The double one on the Spitter Regiment, the Spitter Horde that was there, was a big moment as well, because it stopped his Revenant from going in and joining in with that fight against the flea bags, which really, had he done so, then he may have been able to kill them. So that was a big moment as well. Next game. So this is, let me just check the sheet. The scenario this one is, is dominate. So nothing too fancy about this. By the way, I'm on the top table now. So I'm getting a nosebleed at this point. So dominate against the forces of nature. Dominate, of course, being the scenario where you want to take the center of the table. You have to be within 12 inches of the center point. The whole of the unit has to be within 12 inches. And then any individuals will be worth 50% that are in there as well. So this is one of those games where you rock up to the table and you think that is a really nicely painted army, but I'm not 100% sure what any of it does because I haven't got a great deal of experience facing the old forces of nature. I think I may have played them once and maybe another time as allies to another army but I definitely don't remember what their units do particularly, other than the fact, I think last time I played them, they had unicorns healing everyone, but apparently they're not broken anymore for some reason. I don't have all the info on that. Like I said, not a huge amount of experience against the forces of nature. You know what, I'm going to open the rule book on their page right now so I can actually name some of their units. Now, I'm, let me just check if they're actually in. Here they are. Right, they're in the main rulebook, the forces of nature, so I might be able to give you names of some of their units. With it being dominate, I of course want my meaty center strategy to hold the middle of the table. So I've got my trolls, my giants, the mincer, and the war trombone right in the middle. And all these terrible units here, sharp sticks, flea bags, and the spitters, and the, my individual characters on flea bags are just there to kind of stop his flank and hopefully hold them up for long enough so that by the time they kill off what's down here, they can't m work their way back to the center. And yes, Mickey, the unicorns did spray out magical horn juice, much like Cecil the Magical Unicorn does on a regular basis. So I'll go through his list to the best of my abilities in a moment, but you can see on this flank here, 
I've deployed them, kind of crossing over each other, which I don't mind because this unit's nimble and can just run off wherever it likes. And over here, these guys are obviously going to stay back and shoot. And I'm advancing with my big wall of meat. I very much like this meaty center. Normally, I have it the giants on one side and the bruiser between the two troll hordes. But for some reason, I didn't go for that here. I wanted the trolls on the outside with the mincer as backup. This, has, as a center of an army, very rarely is it going to come up against something that I'm afraid of facing off with. Because even if you get the charge in on giants, if you waver them, they'll still counter charge you. If you don't kill off the trolls, then they're going to regen their wounds, and one of them has dwarven ale, so they might be able to counter charge you even if they're wavered. And even if something dies, I've got the mincer as backup. So there's just so much pain that can be dished out from this block here. I'm very, very confident that whatever people put in the middle of their army isn't going to stand up to it, usually. I'm sure there are some counters for it, but I need the flank of my army to hold up whatever they've got on there. If they overload a flank, I need to just hold them up and stop them coming in to flank this lot. So that's my general plan here. Now, let's have a look at some of his units, because they are amazingly painted. You can see that one of them moving up here. He's got a few large beasts that all seem to be fairly similar. It may have been a beast of nature. So a lot of monster-sized things that all look fairly similar. And over here, this one here is, let's see if I can get the actual name here. It is, it's something large. It may actually, it may be a tree herder, possibly. I think it is a tree herder because it has surge. So that big one there is a tree herder, I think. So I'm sure someone could correct me if they know any better. And the unit over there are a unit that can be surged. So they will be, or this might be them actually. They might be forest shamblers. And this unit, I think, are, I'm sure this is riveting listening, by the way, as I try and figure out what all this stuff actually is. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what they are. They may be Hunters of the Wild, that unit there, because all this stuff vanguarded up into my face before the game even started, which was pivotal in me deciding to take the first turn, because he didn't really have any shooting. I've got quite a bit of shooting, so I thought, if I don't go first, I may only get one turn to actually shoot with anything. So I decided to go first, which I usually don't. I usually let my opponent go first, because a lot of my shooting isn't going to be in range if I go first. And also, in a, in a tournament like this, there were no turn sevens, by the way, if I didn't mention that. So going last, and also knowing the exact moment the game is going to end, I find that even more beneficial going second, because you, not only are you ending the game on turn six, you're definitely going to have the last turn, picking going last, but you also know that the game's ending on turn six. So you know for a fact when that turn six is going on, okay, this is the final turn of the game. Whatever I do can't be countered, which I think is a good position to be in. So I usually go second, but first on this occasion. Then, moving along, this lady here. I think this is the green lady. Let's have a look at her. Yes, it is. So she flies and she has heal eight. So if she's lucky, she could heal eight wounds on a unit, which is quite ridiculous. 200 points. She has regeneration as well. A few things have regeneration in this army, so the fire oil is actually somewhat useful here. And let's see what else is in there. This big beastie here, I can't remember exactly what that is. But there's some pretty tough units here that are quite fast as well. He's got three big beefy units. Some of them are really tough cavalry, which would be the Worm Riders, I think. Let's see. Nyad Worm Riders. So where are they? They might be these guys here. And he's also got a flying beast. I think this is a Pegasus, or a Pegasus, as it clearly is here, hiding behind a rock at the start of the game which is a big piece of impassable terrain. So that's going to be flying out and causing some damage. So he's got a couple of flying units in there. And this large beast here has moved forward towards my flea bags down on this side, towards my sniffs. And you can see just how far up he was able to get very early on. With his vanguard and his first move of the game, he was right in my face with some of this stuff, which I don't like at all. Over on this flank, he's positioned these units, because they're very fast as well. So that thing is pretty much going to eat the big rock thrower, and that thing is probably going to eat 
the Fleabag sniffs if I don't do something quickly. Now he positioned this guy out of range of the War Trombone, which is a clever move, but as we head into turn two, you'll see why he overlooked one crucial issue shortly. I decided to charge these Fleabags out because if I don't charge them, they were probably in range to charge me and I was just going to get killed regardless, so I might as well try and get a hit in on them, see if I could get lucky. But no, I'm not sure whether I did damage. I certainly didn't get rid of them. They are a beautifully painted army. Guardian Easter says in the comments. Yes, they are. This is like a serial winner of best painted awards, this army, I think. Very, very nice. Possibly the best army I've ever played against in Kings of War visually. Very likely, actually. He's a bit of a master painter, this guy. Then you can see that I parked my... I think that's the bigot has parked in front of that big monster there because the p exact positioning I put him in, if I charged him, he would have been able to pivot round and charge off at someone else. I wanted him in such a way because he's not nimble or anything. So with a single pivot, there's no way he can charge into the spitters. So that's just to block there. Mickey Jenver is very amazed by the look of this army. Yes, it is truly a sight to behold. Then... Over on this side, I'm advancing, but all his mounted knights, all his cavalry are staying back. Which I would assume is so that his powerful flank can crush my feeble flank, and then his flank forces can come in and help, and they can all go in a kind of pincer motion from both sides at once. So I'm going to have to really take the fight to him and actually kill off his cavalry back in his half before his flank crushes mine. Over on this side, I've had to turn some units round because of the threat coming in from the fast mobile stuff over there. And you can see that that Pegasus has actually been removed because he didn't count on this guy. I think he forgot that this guy had the Diadem of Dragonkind. So uh, that put a lot of damage on him, and the Sniffs also shot a couple of wounds off him, and they took him out in one go. So that's very useful. That's going to preserve some of my units over on this side. But it doesn't get rid of this guy, so he charges into the big rock thrower which is going to go down i don't think it landed a hit so it's about to die without landing a hit but it did all right in the previous games so i'm happy with its performance so far up here you can see this beastie survived the little bit of shooting damage that it took and made it into the spitters but it doesn't have a huge amount of attacks this guy so i don't think he's going to shred through them too fast over here though a double charge into the flea bags they're going to go down but i've still got the sharp sticks and a wizard over here i think so they're going to just try and cause annoyance and slow down this lot as much as possible while my meaty center does its work shortly. And yes, they kill off the flea bags. No surprise there. And here you can see that he's, he's starting to spill through the other part of my flank here into the spitters with these guys. And his other stuff's moving over this way now, which is going to be bad if they reach the fight soon. So I've lost a, a few units already. He hasn't lost too much. But look at that. The spitters actually hit back and killed that beast there. So they must have rolled pretty well because they're not very good in combat, the old spitters. And over on this side, he clearly kills the rock thrower. But I've got my shooting attacks here poised to aim at him. The flagget and the sniffs both aiming their respective weaponry in his general direction. In the center here, I've moved one unit of trolls forward because he wasn't advancing. He's clearly just waiting for backup and he doesn't want to face off with my trolls and giants. So I've sent one unit up, begging him to charge me, so that I can then unleash furious counter charges. You'll see that I actually made a little mistake in a minute, though. Over here, he gets a double charge in on my sharp sticks. I think I probably charged him first out of desperation, and it didn't pay off, clearly, because they're about to be toasted. And here, the spitters have been charged by what is probably... What did I say they probably were? Probably Hunters of the Wild. And this, the sharp sticks only get wavered, though, which I'll take, because it's keeping them held up for a little bit longer, so I'm not too disappointed in that one. Over here, you can see that my trolls did get charged, double charged, in fact, by his cavalry. But you can see that he put 13 damage on them, but double won them. Wow, wow, wow. So the trolls have survived that furious double charge. Now, at any point, if you think, well, why didn't the person use their tournament re-roll here. I don't know whether anyone had already used them before those points that you might have, be having those thoughts. I didn't keep track of the times everybody used their re-roll. So 
Yes, you'll have to keep that in mind. So don't go thinking that people just forgot about their rerolls because they may have already used them and I didn't just mention it earlier. But you can see that I made a big blunder here because I actually left my giant slightly within charge range of one of these units. I didn't mean to do that at all. I think it was just barely in. So that was a big mistake on my part, part which allowed the giant to take 10 damage on the charge, but that then allowed me to unleash a furious triple charge with the giants and the bruiser into that unit, which took them out. And my trolls then countercharged after they were double one and put some damage onto that unit. And I've got my flea bag sniffs helping out up here as well. And you'll notice that the troll bruiser overran further than this giant. That's because the giant was getting blocked by them. So I overran with the bruiser, which meant that this giant can't be charged then because that this giant's the vulnerable one that's already taken damage, so I want him to have to charge the bruiser. Turn four. Up here you can see that these trolls have gone over to the left to hold up this advance, and they'd position themselves in such a way, they were facing forwards, and if they turned their flank, if they'd been facing this way when they were charged, they would have been in range to be charged by something up here as well. So they had to take a charge in the flank, but they were so close to the fence, I positioned them, slid them sideways a bit so that it was going to be a hindered charge from this creature here, because that's an obstacle, which is the one thing that forces of nature can't stand. They have a rule that ignores difficult terrain and woods, pretty much, but put a fence in front of them and they just stumble and trip, and it's just so difficult for them to fight over a fence compared to, I don't know, a volcano or a tree. It's just fences are their one weakness. So... He didn't kill off the trolls, as you'd expect, when it's hindered, and they've regened some wounds back, and now they're just in a slugfest with him. In the middle, this is quite a big fat mess here, because we're on this hideously grotesque, bright green hill that was difficult to balance on, so all the units were sliding everywhere. But it was funny, at least. And you can see here that I've got a bruiser into the flank there. And I'm not sure if all these units have bounced. I don't think I'm actually fighting in that flank. I think he charged me here. So the bruiser, or they will bounce at the end of it. So this is a double charge he's got, I think, on this unit of trolls. He's making absolutely sure that he kills them here. And, of course, they do die, naturally. Then, actually, what may have happened, these guys may have actually charged the flea bag sniffs that I'd brought into the fight quite needlessly. I didn't really need them there. And he may have charged and killed them as well. So that might be what happened there. So both these units are now dead. I could have done with those flea bag sniffs not doing that. I just threw them in to do a bit of extra damage to try and take out a unit while I had the chance. So you can see that those guys have killed my spitters now. And over here, these guys are finally finished off with my sharp stick horde, and they're making their way back to the center. You can see my opponent's blurry hand there. Turn five. So it's getting juicy. This fight's raging on. More damage being done to that big beastie, but he's got a unit down here as well. And uh, I'm not sure I actually took a picture of it, but at some point my trombone killed off that unit that was rampaging on my right flank, by the way. Let's see, David Kiteley says, nice one, Andy, did you meet up with Rem whilst in Leicester? No, because I'm pretty sure Rem is an incredibly busy rock star and doesn't have time for piffling things such as Kings of War tournaments. Moving on now, where were we? Okay, we were here. So I've got a nice triple charge here. What I wanted to do, we actually had to spend quite a bit of time working out whether I could legally do this. I wanted the Mincer to charge into that unit there, and I wanted the Giant, the Giant, and the Troll Bruiser to charge into this unit here. But the way they were positioned, the mincer was going to get stuck and didn't quite have room to do it. And in the end, I ended up not doing that and ended up just charging these three units into the cavalry instead, which the mincer actually, if he's not hindered, he has exactly the same attacking potential as a giant. So it's not a bad substitution to make. And also the mincer is going to be the one he's probably going to have to attack. I think that's why I went for it in the end. The mincer is going to end up blocking this area here, because when I kill that unit, I'm going to overrun the mincer and probably not overrun these units because I want to protect the giant. And here, it looks like I actually wavered that unit there. Let's see if that's a picture of him 
moving them or remo removing them. Let's see, is that... Okay, so that unit there is actually this unit here. So I did kill them. This must be him taking them away, I think. Maybe. I don't know. But that's the other unit here that charge in, and it looks like they've gone into the... possibly the bruiser. I'm not sure what's gone on here. But he's fighting something. Again, it's difficult because of everything sliding up and down this hill, so I'm not sure where things are supposed to be. I would recommend anyone putting hills in your tournament don't make them really slidey, slippy, knobbly hills like this. Over here, they are about to eat the water on bone for dinner. Of course, water on bones can't stand up to close combat. Trolls are still fighting him. And of course, the water on bone's dead, so they're now poised to go into my flank, but they're wavered. But that is the unit, as you can see, they're the unit with the dead elf on the base, which represents dwarven ale for some reason. So they are going to be able to potentially ignore that Weaver if I roll the 4 plus on my turn. Turn 6. So these three units, after the giant was killed, I was able to charge them into that remaining unit there, I believe, and kill it off. Now this guy killed something as well. I think one of the... I think what actually happened was... Let's just go back a sec. Okay, so this unit didn't die, it was wavered, so it moved backwards as far as it could go, which is why he's moving it with his hand there. So they moved out of shot, and then this unit charged into their place. So they were hiding at the back, so still alive, so still potentially they could dart into the middle in the last turn. So what I did to counter that was, after killing off this unit as well, you can see that the Diadem of Dragonkind wielding Flaggett has perched himself on the hill. That's because he had to reach that point to then use his weapon on the unit that was retreating at the back there and actually killed them. So I got rid of all the cavalry. Guardian Easter says, I guess the Mincer could not pivot enough to charge the unit on the right. It was a very, very complicated situation because units had slid around off that, on and off that hill so much. We couldn't really tell where certain things were supposed to be. And the angles were very, very tricky. So in the end, I decided just not to risk sending the Mincer into that thing on its own because it looked like it wasn't quite possible. Down here, the trolls, you can see, have killed off that guy, that big monster. So they're now in a face-off with this unit here, which is most likely the Hunters of the Wild. Up here, you can see that these two big beasties... Okay, so there's a little story here. I had my wizard up in this general direction here. Those are shamblers. This guy has Surge. So he can Surge, or she, should I say, judging by the shape of the buttocks there. And I think it is a female model. This model here surged those you those guys there into the wizard. It was quite high roll. I think he if let's see what kind of surge that guy has. I think it's where are we? Tree herd a surge eight. Okay, that sounds about right. He needed five inches to reach the wizard on eight. So on average, you should just fail it. And had he failed it, they probably would have failed to reach the center of the table. But he did actually reach and manage to kill it because of that. So. Oh dear, oh dear. So those both get into the middle. And the green lady who was running around just healing things up willy-nilly, which is why you may have noticed damage disappearing on various units of his. With heal 8, that's... it is ridiculous. So I still had quite a juicy amount of expensive models in the middle here. The trolls, the giant, expensive. The troll bruisers fell expensive. And you have to have 200 more points than your opponent in the central area to win. So, let me see, Is that here's the last image from above to show you exactly what's in the centre. All these units pictured here were in the middle. And, would you believe it, he had about 50 points above the threshold required for a win. I think he had 257 points more than me in the middle, after individuals were halved. So, just enough for me to lose the game. Wow, wow. So, of course, if they'd got stuck up on the wizard up there, then it would have been a draw. I think, overall, though... I can't complain too much. It was a very, very strong army, which was well played. The vanguard over on this side really put the cat amongst the pigeons. And I will definitely keep that in mind next time I'm facing forces of nature, the fact that they can take several vanguarding units. It's kind of like when I faced the Abyssals in the last tournament, and I wasn't really sure what any of the units did. I'll take that experience forward in my games against forces of nature, though and 
I'll hopefully do better against them next time. But this was on the top table as well, though, so let's not forget that. Coming very close to getting a draw here. So this is quite a way up from where I usually am at this stage of the tournament, especially with goblins. And now on to game four. So I've dropped down to table three, I think, at this stage, which is still quite high up. And I'm still in with a shout of actually winning the tournament if I get a big win and the people above me either draw or get really tiny wins and barely kill anything. So it's definitely worth going all out for a big win here because it's still wide open. So this time I'm against the forces of the abyss. Now I have to give credit to my opponent here because I think this is the first time I've ever faced an abyssal army where it's almost entirely mantic models. I think there's only a couple of things that aren't official mantic. I think the will of souls, which you can see at the back there, is not mantic. But I'm pretty sure the rest of it is. So the scenario we're looking at here is invade, which is park as many of your units into the opponent's half as possible at the end of the game. So I think yet again I won the roll off for going first or second, and I went second again, which I usually choose. And I think with this scenario it's a good one as well because you can see where exactly your opponent's units are at the end and then decide what's the best way of countering that with the final move of the game. So I went first. You can see that I've spread all the way along the table, and so has he, but you can't actually see all of his because some of it's already moved when this picture was taken. But with it being invaded, you can't leave a gap anywhere, really, because the enemy will just flood into it and be in your half. And if you go back and fight them, then you're just stuck fighting in your own half, and then you might not be able to get back to the enemy half again. So you don't want to leave any gaps at all, really. So we haven't. He's put fast units on that flank against my little shooting block. And I've got my huge meaty centre here, which isn't going to be too threatened from that side of the rock. You'll see why in a moment. But when these armies went down on the table and we were looking at the units across the table from each other, this is one of the only times where I feel like, you know what, if, all, if our armies just mash into each other in the middle, I'm going to win this. I felt like my army looked stronger than the opponent's army. I don't know whether that's actually true on paper or not, but that's just a feeling I got looking across the table. Often I'll look at the opponent's army and think, hmm, that looks scary, that looks scary, that looks scary, that doesn't, that does. But in this army, I wasn't particularly scared of most of it. Only the Well of Souls, really, because I had, <laughs> you may remember in the last tournament, that did quite well against me. Okay, so I've got my fast wing over on this side, which contains the flea bags, the sniffs, and the bigots in the middle. I've got the sharp stick with the mincer for backup. And then the big meaty area here. You'll notice I always put the giants starting in difficult terrain or in the woods when possible. That's because, of course, they can charge out of it unhindered and also trolls and such will be more bothered by the difficult terrain and giants are also faster so being in the difficult areas is more beneficial for the giants than the trolls so if you've got to have some units in the difficult terrain it might as well be giants uh, let's see guardian easter says i hate tabletop games you have to think about what you were doing i prefer charge and hope the dice go well well people can certainly play kings of war that way if they like I don't know how well they'll do, but you can definitely give it a go. Over on this flank, he's got gargoyles, and he's got some hellhounds. I'm not sure if the I'm not sure if the abyss are in the main rule book. Let's have a look. I think they are actually. Let's see here. Are they in the rule book? Because I remember looking at their units when I was reviewing the last tournament. So you would think they'd be in here somewhere because I don't think I have the other book. Let's see, are the forces of the abyss in here? Well, apparently I can't see them if they are, so probably not. Okay, so I can pretty much remember what the units do though, since I played against them last time, and especially against this army where all of the units are pretty self-explanatory visually, you can tell what everything is because he's using the official models. So let's move on. Zooming in on those units there, you can see we're using a very stylish app here rather than a real chess clock in this game. I don't think I actually used my app once during the day because most people had fancy chess clocks. Here, now this is a shooting unit here, and there's an Efreet. The Efreet is the one that has Fireball 20, which is quite obscene, so I'm a bit scared of them. 
but this unit's shooting attack isn't quite as scary as him. Then in the middle, I think these are lower abyssals, this big horde here. And then these things, now what are they called? Maybe succubi, something like that. They're really, really nasty though. And the Will of Souls behind them, which has the uncanny ability to remove wounds from friendly models and absorb them onto itself. And it also has Life Leech 5. So if it's absorbing wounds from friendly models and fighting, then it's going to be leeching all the damage back from your whole army, potentially. So it's really, really good, that thing. Over here he's got some Mollocks, which are fairly similar to Trolls. And he's got some slightly more potent regular infantry there, with some crushing strength. He's got more of the Hounds, another Efreet. And the guy at the back there is a Lord of some description, so he's going to be a bit more fighty. Okay, so over on this flank, I move my cavalry forward a little bit. I'm laying down the gauntlet to him because I'm faster than him. Faster than these hounds. They're speed 9, all my cavalry is speed 10. So I'm moving into my charge range, but not his. Just inviting him, seeing if he wants to go for it. And also I can be shooting him as well with the sniffs this whole time. And also the bigot has a bow. So with their combined shooting attacks, I get 2 damage on them. Not enough to remove them or waver them though, but it's a start. Now, a lot of stuff in his army has regen as well, but we'll get to that when we get to my fire oil wielding spitters, because that's going to be quite useful against abyssals, because a lot of regen. Okay, so I've positioned my breath weapons here, the diadem of dragonkind and the trombone, because I'm worried about his speedy flank coming in and disrupting my shooting zone. And you can see that through shooting, I think this was a rock that landed on them, I put five damage on them, so this is over on my right flank or his left and there's my little shooting battery there and you'll see these dice here that's because in front of this was parked the gargoyles and the hellhounds I shot the gargoyles and I rolled a double one and I thought do I want to use my reroll in turn one on a cheap unit of gargoyles and then I looked and thought this is very very fragile if he's allowed to charge me with two units here he's gonna stop all my shooting pretty much for the whole game and he's probably going to wear through them and probably kill almost everything here. And I don't really want that to happen. So I think I had to use my reroll because I did not want this unit to be charged and the rock thrower to be charged. I wanted him to make a choice before he was inevitably killed by all my breath attacks. So I really wanted that unit dead. So I rerolled it and I got a three, which was just enough to kill it because it was already over double ones bill. So it was worth it. I almost, you can say I almost failed again to kill it turn two. So he's advancing up with his beefy, tough, hard-hitting units, and the Ifrit as well is going to be launching fireballs willy-nilly. And from that he actually puts four damage on my sharp stick horde. He doesn't seem to be shooting at my trolls at this stage. Yeah, he is now with this lot here. So fireball and their shooting attack presumably. On the trolls, five damage on them. And over here, you can see that he made the choice to charge over this way. And the way I would positioned my the flag it with the Diadem of Dragonkind, he was able to charge that first and then charge through into the big rock thrower. So that was a bit of a mistake on my part. When he was going for the charge, he wasn't sure whether he could legally do it or not. But I was pretty sure he could. So in the end, he went through him into him because it was tricky the way he was trying to maneuver around by the charging by the shortest route depending which angle he would be at and so on because of course the individual character turns to face you and you have to center yourself on him so it was all quite fiddly but in the end he ended up taking out both of these units in one go as you can see so they've definitely earned their points there but then the trombone just obliterates them as expected so he did weaken my flank a bit but I've still got a decent amount there. I've still got my spitter horde down here, which are, if nothing else, they're going to be some nice points that I can march relatively unopposed into his half because that's his entire left flank or right as I look at it, severely weakened now. And it's going to get weaker still because my trolls charges a freet, hoping to kill it and overrun into these dudes, but I can't quite get, get rid of him. You can see he's wavered there. In the middle, this was a big risk on my part. The two giants charging into, I believe they're succubi. If that's wrong, someone can correct me. 
And I knew for a fact if I didn't kill them and overrun or turn, I would be charged in the flank on this giant here. This one's safe because that unit's line of sight is like that. This unit's line of sight, of course, is like that. So they're going to get a, a flank charge on this giant. And these guys have ensnare, which means that you're at minus one to hit against them. So I didn't do that much damage. I only did four, as you can see. And unfortunately, I could not remove them. So that giant's going to get flank charged. But I took the risk. It just didn't quite pay off. However, I have got trolls poised further down so that if he does flank charge me and fails, he is going to get shredded big time with this unit, which is his biggest unit. So I'm not, we'll see whether he risks it or not. Down here, I've positioned my Fleabag Sniffs behind his Hillhounds, and I shot a lot of damage into them. They were to 11, and then I double one them. And as you know, I already used my reroll in turn one. So that's two double ones so far. So there's no escaping the double one, even in tournaments that allow rerolls. If you're going to do it multiple times, it doesn't help you whatsoever. Then over here, those hounds were then, because they were double one, they were then able to join in the charge on my sharp stick regiment, along with his Mollocks, who are quite tasty. And look at this. So the Well of Souls, after his lower abyssals charged into the flank of the giant, that opened up the path for the Well of Souls to do a massive long charge into the Troll Bruiser. Because he had he'd taken a bit of damage on him from another unit nearby, he just absorbed it onto him, and then he got that back in combat against the Bruiser, I think. But he couldn't kill the Bruiser, so he's definitely going to get flank charged by these trolls here. So we'll see whether that was a big mistake on his part as well. Okay, looking at this, I've wavered that unit there with shooting, no doubt, because I've still got my Spitter Horde, who were peppering them with shots. And look, there's that giant dead. So you can see the Horde turned round, face forwards again. So they didn't expose their flank because they just killed the giant. So my gamble in the centre there did not pay off. We'll see whether that comes back to bite me. The hounds and the mollocks kill the sharp sticks in one go, so it's starting to fall apart a bit. However, I've been looking at the Kings of War Facebook group recently, and there was a lot of discussion on charges with nimble units that go around one unit and into another. So those are only height one. So a height two cavalry unit can see over them, so I can see this unit here with these flea bags, And they're nimble, so I can turn on the spot to face 90 degrees to the right, I can then move forward and then turn to the left and then charge the unit behind them. And the Minster is also down here. So all that combined allowed me to get a double charge on this unit of Mollocks and ignore those crippled hounds because I felt I could just move this whiz into position and fire a lightning bolt at them and kill them because they're already at double one town. So just one damage on them. I didn't want to waste a charge on them with one of these units. So I double charged the Mollocks, even though the cavalry will be hindered I think it's still worth it to ignore this unit because they're facing the wrong way and just a lightning bolt will kill them. So sneaky tactics there. Now these trolls took out the the Ifrit died and that's what they killed because the unit behind the Ifrit that I wasn't able to over and into because they'd already been killed by these guys here. These spitters had already taken them out so they exploded so he's got nothing at all on his left flank so my right flank is totally free so I can move this unit up and just park in his half now I think because they're not going to be able to reach the rest of the battle and the trolls are going to be able to march back into the fight that's going on in the middle and help out over there and they're barely damaged as well so that's going to be fun now in this little situation here I couldn't get rid of those dogs by the way because I rolled uh, this guy it might look like his view is blocked here but these have actually bounced off in combat after damaging the Mollocks, so now they're obscuring him. But he was able to shoot because they were further forward with the charge. So he fired into them, but missed with every single one of his lightning bolt shots, so he couldn't even damage them. So, wow, wow. Next up, the Troll Bruiser and the Trolls combined to kill the Well of Souls in one go. Trolls in the flank is not pleasant. 36 Troll attacks with crushing strength 2. Not many things are going to stand up to that, and the Well of Souls certainly did not. So that is dead, and that's the one unit in his army I was really worried about. So I'm feeling very confident now. My right-hand side and the middle are going quite well. Here you can see that he double-charges. I think he double-charges the Mincer, actually. 
because he knows how dangerous it is with its Thunderous Charge 3. So if you can do damage on it, at least, whether you kill it or not, you're going to take away its most potent weapon when it counter charges you. And these guys are still going to be hindered because they're in terrain, so they're not having their Thunderous Charge regardless. And here you can see that his lower abyssals were charged by my trolls. The ones that were... let me see which troll unit this is. Is this the one that was involved in the fight with the... Okay, they're the ones with the obelisk. So it's not the obelisk unit. This is the unit that was fighting the Will of Souls with the Troll Bruiser. So they moved up and they get into a bit of a slugfest with these lower abyssals. And the giant is still fighting the succubi, which is really difficult for one giant to do enough damage against a unit that has minus one to hit. Very, very difficult indeed. And of course, the giants are pretty sturdy, so they take a while to take down as well. And I think both these units actually have Fury, so they can still countercharge while wavered, which is why it's taking even longer for the fight to really get going. Okay, now this guy. It looks like he's about to do some flamey action because I've taken a picture of him. What does he do? Okay, he puts some damage onto the Fleabag Riders for damage because they weren't charged, of course. And look at this, the Mincer is dead as a result of that double charge from the Lord and the Mollocks. So off goes the Mincer. And in the centre, I take out his lower abyssals <coughs> with a combo charge. I can't remember whether all my trolls went into them or not. There may have been two units of trolls charging them, though, and the bruiser. And I think this unit was in the flank. So that was a billion attacks on them, a billion damage, and off they went. So the centre is pretty much mine, and it's looking very good for me at the moment. It's looking like this big, strong, meaty centre of mine, minus the giants, who haven't done that great, are going to start mopping up towards the left now. Over on this side, I waver that unit again, but of course no difference because they have Fury. And my flea bags are looking like they're going to get killed very shortly because they're surrounded. And this guy gets wavered actually. I think I might have shot at him with something and put one damage on him and wavered him. That may have been my bigot who's camped somewhere in the top left corner of the table right now. Over here, I try and lightning bolt the hounds again. And what do you know, he misses all his lightning bolt shots for the second time in a row. Wow, wow. this wizard, he's, he packed his wrong wand today, or he got out the wrong side of wizard bed today. And look at this. So, the wizard, not satisfied with his wand any longer, decided, you know what? Because this guy, this lord, wounded the wizard in combat, so I couldn't shoot anyway. So I thought, I'm just going to charge those hellhounds instead. Because if I do one damage on them, I could still get rid of them, because they're already way beyond the, the point of needing any kind of decent roll. So he charges them, he rolls and actually hits them on a 6, and then does damage as well, taking them up to 12. But look at that, then he double ones them. Wah, wah, wah. So this wizard is just the ultimate failure in this game, I'm afraid. Three goes to take out this unit, and he fails terribly. And what's this? Another double one? Surely not, I hear you cry. Well, we've got... the giant here was killed by this point, by the succubi. And the troll bruiser and the trolls both go into the succubi, pile up damage on them, really high. And look at that. Double one again. So I think that's four or five double ones I've had in this game. And of course, I was only able to re-roll one of them. So the luck is certainly against me, but the game is still going well somehow, despite all that. These trolls are... That's not that unit. So these trolls must have just killed something. Let's see if they were lined up to fight something. They may have killed the Mollocks. I think they killed the Mollocks... They kind of charged in from this direction, and then after the fight, they turned back round to face that way again because they need to be in the opponent's half to get those points, those juicy, juicy victory points. Then the bigot, after we determined that the bigot was guaranteed to finish in my own half because the center line is right there, so after fighting him, I would bounce away an inch and end up in his half, guaranteed. So that's the only reason I went for the charge on him, just to try and kill him off one final action and couldn't take him out, though. And these guys just march extra far into the enemy half, just to make sure there's no doubt. And here's the end of the game with the centre line down the table with this tape measure, so you can see where it is. So he's got that unit of nice fighty abyssals, which didn't do too much fighting during the game, to be honest. They just kind of camped in my half when they got there. 
And then he's got a couple of individuals there in my half. I've got the bigot there in his half. Then the trombone wasn't in his half because I needed it here to kill those hellhounds off that the wizard couldn't kill on three separate occasions. So the trombone just toasted them completely and I didn't fail the roll again, so they died. And these two troll units killed off the succubi, so they're both in his half nicely, scoring me a lot of points because they're very expensive. And the spitter horde are quite expensive as well, they're in his half and so is that wizard. So that's the final picture. So you can see it was quite a clear win for me here. You need 200 more points than the opponent, generally. And I think I had about 450, at least, more points than he did in his half. So quite a convincing victory, despite the prevalence of double ones throughout the game, which went against me. But it wasn't enough. The trolls managed to secure the win. And that's quite a healthy, solid win. I killed almost everything. He's only got those three units left, so that's going to be quite healthy. Looking like either an eight, probably a nine score, I would think, looking at that, because he's not got that many points left. So that's going to be quite a juicy one. So all that remained was the final standings, which I'm going to look at on my phone right now to make sure I can tell you exactly where each race finished. So I can tell you right now that in the whole tournament overall, I finished second which is definitely my highest finish ever, the first time I finished in the top three of a tournament. And looking at the scores, the guy who finished at the top was the one who beat me in round three. And he finished five points above me. So I can rest easy in the knowledge that even if I'd managed to sneak a draw out of the round three game at the end, I still would have finished a point behind him. So I still wouldn't have won the tournament even if I'd managed to weasel a draw. So that's always the most agonizing, isn't it? Where you think, well, if only that one dice roll had gone in my favor, I would have won. So I don't have any worries like that because I would have still finished second whether that game was a draw or a loss. So don't have to worry about that. And just to give you a rundown of the races. So Forces of Nature finished first. Goblins, which was me, in second. And then after that, in order, we've got Undead, Empire of Dust, Kingdom of Men, Ratkin, Ratkin, Orcs, Ratkin, Abyssals, Ratkin, Dwarves, Forces of Nature, Forces of Nature. So there were 14 people in the tournament, so I'm very impressed that I was able to finish second. The scoring was actually very, very close. The top, after the top one, the next four players were very, very close together. I was just ahead of the following three people, which had Undead, Empire of Dust, and Kingdom of Men. So very, very tight. And then, of course, the two Ratkin players after that, making up the top half. So I can say, of the tournaments I've been to, the batch of opponents I faced this time, probably because I was towards the top tables the whole time, it was very, very high standard of play, I felt, from my opponents, just in general play. I'm sure you can look at this and say that people made mistakes, but just people... You can tell when someone's looking at a table what kind of cogs are turning in their head, the kind of calculations they're making. And you can tell when someone knows what they're doing, pretty much. And I felt that all my opponents, to at least a very reasonable degree, knew what they were trying to accomplish during the game. They had a plan, they were planning ahead, lining things up. And I would say that I'm extremely proud to finish second in what I feel was a pretty good field of players. So, anyone have any questions? Let's see. Guardian Easter says, where did you buy those dice? Were they cheap? Uh, which dice are you talking about? If you're talking about the lovely orange dice, which are these ones here, I think I actually got those from Bad Squiddo Games slash The Dice Bag Lady these orange dice. I've got two sets of them, so I have 20. I'd use them for pretty much all my attack rolls in Kings of War. And if I have more than that, I usually roll them in several handfuls because it's easy to see the numbers on them. There's going to be no confusion. There's no swirly business going on. They're just nice and clear. Nice, big, chunky orange dice of goodness. And the white ones I use for these little wound trays are just your standard the kind of dice you get in every boxed game. So any questions on the tournament? Drop them in there. Uh, Mickey says, not many undead armies. I thought they were the power army. Well, the last tournament, there were no undead. And at this tournament, there was only one undead. So maybe people are going off them. And also in the, the update that's coming for, for undead, 
some of the powerful builds that are out there at the moment aren't going to be, be possible anymore because they're taking away some of their ability to have defense six on some of their heroes. So that's going to be interesting to see how people react to that and what kind of undead lists people come up with. I've been throwing a few ideas around because, of course, I used a lot of Defense 6 vampires and a Pegasus within Source Alarma in tournaments. So I'm looking at possibly adding even more zombie legions and maybe using Morgoth the Faceless, perhaps. I haven't used him before, so that might be fun. Right, let's whiz back through the images here while I'm waiting to see if anyone has any questions on any of these games, or the tournament in general, or the tournament scene, or the venue, Black Dragon Miniatures. It's like going back in time, it's like your life passing before your eyes before death. I'm going to try and wrap this up in the next 10 minutes or so at the very latest, because I've got some people coming around in about 35 minutes for a 40k game tonight. I think these videos usually end up lasting about two hours. I think I I was talking a bit faster than usual during this one with that in mind, knowing that I actually had my... So I'm not sure how long it's actually taken. It's going to end up pretty close to two hours, though, I think. I look at those lovely piles of dice. If I need any extra attacks, I use the small ones. And 20, by the way, of these dice is the optimal amount to fit into my hands. More than that, and it might become a struggle with the size of dice. I'm sure there are some people with gargantuan hands out there that could manage a lot more. as we continue to whiz. Let's make it a bit faster, shall we? So the venue, when I got there in the morning, it was quite cold, actually. But I was pleased for that by mid-afternoon, because it slowly warms up, obviously, as lots of sweaty war gamers are in there, playing games, throwing dice around, getting all excited. So it was just a perfect temperature by the end of the day. Normally these places put the heating on really, really early, I find, and it's by, the, by lunchtime it's like a, an absolute sweat pit. And I'd been quite ill the day before, actually. I was almost considering not even going to this tournament, but I thought, you know what, I'll just go to bed and see how I feel in the morning, and I felt pretty well enough, so I decided it was worth it to go. And definitely worth it. Finishing second, highest ever tournament finish. My previous highest, I think, was fourth with Undead but never been in a position to get a prize before. I did actually get a prize for this one. It's a £10 gift voucher for Black Dragon Miniatures, which I'll no doubt spend next time I'm there, because there wasn't really enough time after the tournament. As some of the games run a bit long, and imagine if Turn 7 was in effect in this tournament as well. It would have gone on even longer. So I can see why, if you want to have four games in a day at a tournament, I can see why people take Turn 7 out of the equation completely. Let's see. Oh, we've got a comment from Andrew Gilbert. Yesterday, my Pygmies League of Raw Deer got badly beaten by Abyssals. They are tough. Congratulations on win and second place. Yes, Abyssals are indeed very tough. There are some very nasty Abyssal lists with a lot of massed dice shooting attacks, which are very, very hard to deal with. But I think breath weapons and things of that nature are going to be changed as well in the upcoming update. So it's going to be interesting to see how that affects people's list building. Because you can take an Abyssal list that has just an obscene amount of fireballs and such being thrown around. It's possible to take lots of Ifrits, and Cronius has a ton of shooting dice as well. So chuck around willy-nilly. And I think we're almost back to game one in the pictures here, which was the very nicely painted dwarves, which we're about to reach. Any second... So we skip past the undead. Yeah, there we are. So all the tables were very good at this tournament as well. There was a lot of terrain, as you could see, which makes me doubly glad that I didn't stick with the experimental flea bag horde, because at no point would I have been able to get a full effect charge in with them, because they would have always been hindered looking at the vast amount of terrain on this. There were obstacles and woods and difficult terrain all over the place. I mean, just look at that. There's very little space for you to manoeuvre without being hindered somehow. I mean, the hills don't cause any hindrance, but of course they can block some line of sight. So, a lot of terrain, but it didn't ruin any of the games, as far as I'm concerned. Let's keep whizzing back, shall we? Okay, I'm getting ready to wrap this one up, folks, so any final comments you want to get in? Now would be the time. This 
So we continue to fly through the images. Okay, we're almost back at the start now. Okay, there we go. So of course that's a lovely picture from game one where my flea bags were double charged and they I think they died during that. So thoughts on my list. I'm thinking of tweaking it a bit. The bigot, he in no way did he do enough to justify his inclusion in the army. I'm sure if I'd rolled better with him, he would have been able to stop a few people shooting now and then, but I don't think it's worth it for the points. I would much rather have another flagget who is cheaper, who I can then put a really nasty item on, like the Holy Hand Grenade, for example, which has a 50-50 chance of doing massive damage. It's almost as potent as like a, a rock thrower, almost. And it's not ex it's not that expensive. It's cheaper than the Diadem of Dragonkind, so I could have two flaggets, one with each. And I think that would be pretty damn tasty indeed. I'm really going to consider that because that would just be another big threat to the enemy, a big, nasty, potential, annoying shooting attack. Short range again, but I think it would have done more in this tournament than the Flagget. I'm also thinking of taking out the Fleabag Sniffs. They did a few decent things in this tournament, but I would like to experiment with more beasts, because I do have some balls from Macrocosm, which I'm basing up at the moment to use as more beasts. They're like bouncing balls with angry faces and teeth. They kind of look like squigs. So once I've got them painted, I might try and factor them into the list as well. Other than that, I actually like pretty much everything that I've got in there. I like the amount of giants and trolls that I've got. I'm not sure whether adding any more of those would be good. Adding more giants would be probably not advisable because I wouldn't. I just wouldn't have that many attacks. Adding more trolls is certainly potentially something that might be interesting, but then it, once you have three of something, it starts to look a bit spammy, doesn't it? So I'm not sure I would ever do that. I like to have a bit of a balanced list. Also something to note, my army, this particular list, very rarely am I actually taking yellow bellied rolls. I'm sure sometimes I just forget to do it, but it doesn't come up that often because most of my front line is not made up of actual goblin units. They don't have it. And then many of my other units are generally counter charging, like the Sharp sticks are very rarely making the first charge because they're one of the slower units. So they're usually counter charging something. The mincer is one that has to make his yellow bellied roll, but he's quite cheap. And the cavalry, often they're angling themselves to try and attack flanks and so on. So sometimes you're not going to need to roll it with them because you don't need to do yellow bellied when you're counter charging or attacking a flank or a rear. So not many of those rolls are actually necessary with this list because of the large amount of giants and trolls. The troll bruiser, of course, doesn't need it either. So minimizing one of the goblin weaknesses there, I feel. Anyway, Mickey Genvis says get another war trombone. That would certainly be an option. I don't think I would ever go above two, although most goblin lists tend to swear by taking three into battle. I don't think I would, personally. Even though they're amazing, I think they're a bit too predictable. and I don't like taking what is seen as the ultimate cheese of the time. So I may stick with one, I may get a second one. The big rock thrower, I think, has earned his keep. He did some nice significant damage during this tournament, so I think he's going to stay in there, for now at least. The sharp stick thrower probably isn't going to come back in anytime soon. He's going to stay in the draw. The rabble, they're nice and cheap, but I've never really found a good use for them. So, yeah, next tournament we shall see. I haven't signed up for one other than a doubles tournament in which I'm going to be teaming up with halflings, so I'm going to need a totally different list for that. So we'll see what happens next time. Okay, wrapping this one up now, folks. Thanks for tuning in. The I think there were about 15 people in here at one point. There's about 10 now who have stuck through till the end, which is very nice. I'm sure lots of people will be watching this later. So hello to all of you as well, and goodbye as well, because we're about to go off the air. So feel free to offer me just endless congratulations. And if you want to ask any questions on my almost tournament winning tactics, my second place worthy tactics, because of course I'm now a Kings of War master after breaking into the top three of any tournament for the first time. So I'm now unquestionably a genius in the realm of Kings of War. So ta-ta folks, and good luck if you are embarking on your own tournament adventures very soon. In fact, let me know in the comments if you are. Any game system doesn't have to be Kings of War, and let me know how you get on. Also, don't forget to check out the Facebook group, the Orange Wargaming, 2D6 Orange Wargaming, I think it's called. You can get the link in the description, and you can see all my latest video content and various discussions on there. You can post things that you're working on, 
And if you're into Age of Sigma, of course, you can check out the Andy and Rem Show Facebook group as well. And ta-ta, folks. Catch you next time.